So she's keeping her video off for now. Um, I heard from uh, Mike that he can't be here tonight. Um, I am expecting Sandy. There's Sean. All right, I can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with emergency ordinance number 20-A16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. Committee members who are electronically present at this meeting, um, I'm going to do what I did last time and have you guys say your own names. Um, hi, I'm Ali Pesh, um, and I live... Uh, near Mint Springs. Just go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll figure out how to go around. Hey, it's Costas with that one 250. Thanks, Costas. Um, Before yeah. Highlands. Hi, Joe. I'll just call on you. Um, Matt? Hello, everybody. Matthew Slats. I live on German's Gap. <laughs> Sean? Good evening, Sean Bird, live off of St. George. Valerie? Hi, I'm Valerie Long, I live in Old Trail. Um, Brian? I'm Brian Day and I live up in Emerald Ridge. And then we have our two new members. Uh, Mark, you wanna go first? Yeah, hi, uh, Mark McKenney, I live in the West Hall neighborhood. Thanks. And Michael? Yeah, I'm Michael Monaco. I live uh, in Emerson Commons, which is right near Starfield. Great. Uh, did I miss anybody? We also have Jenny Moore and Ann Malik, our liaisons for the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors. Um, the Good evening, everyone. You guys can say hi, too. <laughs> um, What's next? The persons responsible for receiving public comment are the Crozet Community Advisory Committee. The opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting are posted on the Admiral County calendar. And then um, the staff members, we have Carolyn Schaefer, who can help with any technical issues. Um, and going down the list, I see Kevin McDermott, um, Michaela Cardi, Rachel Falkenstein, Tim Padalino. It looks like that's all of us. Um, sorry, I have last week's or last month's list. So um, we had a few minutes here to introduce um, ourselves. I, I kind of did that, um, but um, I don't know, do you guys have any interest in saying a couple of things who are just, just getting here? Uh, Mark and Michael? Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to participate. Thanks. Um, well, we can go on. Um, did everybody get a chance to look at last um, last month's minutes. I'd like to thank Valerie for taking good minutes and move their approval. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks. Oh, hi, Doug. Um, all right. Hey, Doug, <laughs> um, we will vote all in favor of approving the minutes. You can unmute and say aye. 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 Are you opposed? All right, thank you guys. Um, 
I, we have a committee business at the end, so I guess I'll go ahead and let um, the staff take over with the new draft chapters. Thanks, Allie. I am just getting us set up and always takes just a minute to get all the screens to do what they need to do. <laughs> all right, can everybody see the presentation? Cool. Um, I'm Michaela Cardi, and uh, welcome to the new CAC members. I'm a senior planner with Admiral County Planning. And as Allie mentioned, I'm joined by Rachel Falkenstein and Kevin McDermott in planning, and then Tim Padalino with Parks and Recreation as well. And this evening, we're going to provide an overview of the draft conservation and interpretation chapters. Um, and our goal for the meeting is to provide a brief overview of them and then hear your initial feedback or answer any questions, provide more clarity on things, um, and just hear about anything, uh, just initial thoughts, and then share information about ongoing opportunities to weigh in. This certainly isn't the last time that you can provide feedback. We have two online opportunities that we'll provide more information about. Um, and if you have line by line edits or comments, um, we, we'd ask that you use the online opportunity to do that so that we can hear from a lot of folks this evening or as many people as would like to participate. And some people have already started to use those online opportunities. So thanks for those that have already started to weigh in through publicinput.com. Um, just as a brief overview of what we'll be doing this evening, I'll provide a brief overview of the draft, the draft conservation chapter, and then pause for questions and initial feedback. And then I'll pass it over to Rachel, who will do the same thing, an overview of the transportation chapter, and we'll pause for questions and feedback, and then close by talking about ongoing opportunities to participate in the process, and then just the process overall and next steps that are happening. So moving right into conservation, I'm going to start by very briefly sharing a bit about where we've been in previous conversations and events we've had with community members about conservation. And as many of you know, during the first phase of this project, back in fall of 2019, we had three community workshops that were in person and the outcome of that process was to draft guiding principles and goals. And we were checking in on the 2010 plan, um, as well as hearing about the current conditions in Crozet. And those draft guiding principles and goals were used to um, transition into a virtual process given the pandemic. And um, we used publicinput.com and had a CAC meeting in August of 2020 to hear some feedback on the initial goals that we heard um, just about in concept during the first phase and then start to draft some strategies for um, preserving and enhancing the natural environment in Crozet. And the, la the latest phase, phase three, was drafting recommendations. And we drafted um, initial recommendations and heard feedback from the CAC as well as community members through the virtual meeting as well as the online feedback form. And uh, now I will just talk a little bit about this latest um, engagement because that's probably what's closest in, in memory for everybody. And um, as you can see on the screen, we had an online form that had, these are the results from just a couple questions. Um, and those are shown with the pie charts below. We had questions about concepts and typologies for parks and trails, as well as specific recommendations. Um, and we had over, um, I guess, actually 127 comments left on this form. So there were lots of comments that folks left in addition to answering questions. And the themes from those comments were about the importance of preserving tree canopy and crozet, as well as planting new trees preserving and maintaining existing trails and then constructing new trails as well to add to that network. We heard from lots of folks about the construction of Western Park, as well as funding and implementation plans for park and trail recommendations. Um, and here I'll just make a quick pitch to say that implementation is the next chapter we'll be working on. So um, we're happy to field those questions this evening, but um, we plan to continue and have a more robust conversation about that as we look at all of the chapters and um, get 
your feedback on priorities for those and think about next steps for funding and implementation. So we heard that feedback and stay tuned is um, something I'll, I'll add there. Generally, the conservation chapter um, has a similar format and structure to the land use chapter you saw at the last meeting. It has an overview and background section, as well as a parks and green systems plan that you can see on the upper left of your screen. Um, there's also typologies for parks and trails, sections about the specific parks and trails in Crozet, narrative on other county owned properties that don't fall into either of those categories, as well as um, some existing conditions and recommendations for biodiversity, natural resources, and green systems, as well as cultural and scenic resources. And like the land use chapter, there is a summary slide that has the guiding principle in bold. Um, it has each goal and then recommendations. Obviously, you can't see this here. We'll get into it more in the, later in the presentation. And this is, uh, many of you have seen this before. It's the draft guiding principle for the conservation chapter. And you can see it on your screen. It says to enhance Crozet's natural beauty, existing environmental resources, and the surrounding rural areas with an integrated network of parks and gathering spaces, trails, and natural areas that offer increased opportunities for outdoor recreation and protect natural resources. And this is the draft parks and green systems plan with each of the county owned parks that are called public lands and, and they're shown in dark green and have the, the labels on them. Trails are shown in bright green with dotted lines indicating future trails and the solid lines indicating existing trails and shared use paths are indicated in the same way, but in purple. Um, the environmental features are also shown on this map with preserved steep slopes in the kind of peach pink color and stream buffers and floodplain areas shown in blue. And so this map shows all aspects of the chapter and obviously there's a lot on it. Um, so we have, we've included individual maps throughout the chapter that show each of these components separately. This is intended to really show how um, all of these different aspects of conservation in Crozet relate to one another. And I'll highlight a few of these recommendations later on in the presentation. I'll also note that the green circles you see around the school properties are meant to reflect the recreational areas generally as a location in Crozet. And there's park types outlined in this chapter. And the goal of these is to um, provide a description of expectations for the purpose and function of a natural or of a uh, park, as well as um, the amenities that might be provided there. And so the natural area is intended to preserve and protect natural resources and provide opportunities for respite from the surrounding developed environment. And the example shown here is Licking Hole Basin. Plazas are central amenity spaces intended to function as the primary outdoor civic space for an area. And there's a rendering of the future square, um, which would be a plaza at the former Barnes Lumber site. And recreational parks are, provide a variety of spaces for formal recreation and might include athletic events and gatherings with sports fields, pavilions, playgrounds, and any other associated facilities. And Crozet Park is shown there. There's two types of um, trails or pedestrian paths. A trail is a narrower um, path with a typical width of at least five feet. And the shared use path is wider with a minimum width of 10 feet and has space for both pedestrians and cyclists. The shared use path outside Wickham Pond is, is shown on the right of your screen. And this map is included in the chapter. It shows both trails and shared use paths. So you can focus in specifically on those aspects of the conservation chapter. And again, the dotted lines indicate um, future um, paths and exact alignments would be determined at the time of site planning. This plan is really intended to show important connections within the context of Crozet um, with this goal of an integrated network of parks, trails, and pedestrian and cyclist paths. The biodiversity, natural resources, and green systems section has maps um, of each of these topics. Uh, a couple maps are shown on your screen. Um, green systems, water quality, stormwater management, steep slopes, and biodiversity are all included in the, the current draft. 
And we're also currently collaborating with County GIS staff to develop a map of tree canopy in Crozet, and we'll um, update the draft to include that in a future draft. And the conservation goals, um, there's five of them, and I won't read each of these in detail, but um, you can see that they range in content from community parks, trails, and recreation to natural resource conservation, climate action planning, as well as rural and regional amenities. These were all themes that we've heard throughout the process and um, the recommendations reflect um, us refining and hearing from you all throughout the process on priorities. So this is the overall page uh, that shows the guiding principle goals and in letters, each of the recommendations it might be a little hard to see so um, the full text is, is online and we'll, have, we'll be happy to share another link to that. I'll highlight a few of the recommendations that we've had a lot of interest or heard a lot of interest about and a lot of discussion around throughout this process. The first is the very first recommendation 1A about Western Park, um, constructing Western Park in accordance with the 2018 master plan, which is shown on your screen. 1B is managing Licking Hole Creek and the surrounding area primarily as a natural area with passive recreation opportunities and trails that are compatible with environmental features and the wildlife habitat, such as the wetlands and bald eagles nest in the area. Recommendation 2A is about the Crozet Connector Trail. Extend and upgrade the Crozet Connector Trail to an accessible connector route from downtown to West Hall creating a multimodal route with a natural aesthetic that serves as the backbone of Crozet. And finally, the last one I'll highlight is recommendation 5A about tree canopy. Explore opportunities to enhance and expand Crozet's urban forest and increase native tree canopy within and adjacent to Powell's Creek and Licking Hole Creek Greenways, the Licking Hole Basin Natural Area and on county owned parcels such as parks, natural areas and public lands. And um, that was, again, an overview of the chapter. Happy to answer any questions or hear any feedback, initial reactions, um, additions. Um, we have about 20 minutes for that on our agenda. Thanks, Michaela. Um, I see Joe's hand. Go ahead. Hey. Yeah, thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, no, I, I thought this this draft looked really, really good. I just had uh, three comments. One is is really small, and one's kind of just a, a comment, and then one is maybe a, a possible suggestion. The first, under the conservation guiding principles, one uh, e, just a really small one. It says it says establish new trailheads to increase vehicular access. Um, just maybe just clarifying that. Like I first read that, I was like vehicular access like could be read to like like mountain bikes on the trail or something and i think what we we're getting at is like allowing people with vehicles to get to the trails i think is the, the intent there just just a small like wordy thing um one d and and i appreciate it throughout this this focus on the wastewater management facility along crozet avenue which i frankly didn't even know about um and i was like was reading through here and i was like what is that and i had to go look it up um so i thought that was a cool focus because i saw that come up a couple of times and I think that was a really neat focus. I, I don't recall that we had really discussed that here, but I, I appreciated that. That seemed like a cool opportunity um, to be trailheads and, and provide some access there. And the last thing that I'll, that I'll add is one thing that's, that's not in there. I, I went back to the 2010 master plan. I was just trying to see kind of how they lined up. And the only thing that I really saw that wasn't in there, it's a very small thing, but in the 2010 master plan, there's a specific reference to dark skies you know, and, and the, the desire to retain dark skies and prevent light pollution, especially in this part and retain those views. And I'm wondering, it might just fit in that view corridors and vistas section. You know, it might be worth just adding a sentence or two, you know, part of the views and vistas that we have includes dark skies. And it and, and may be as simple as just moving that language forward from the 2010 plan, because I, I, I don't know that, I, I don't think it's really come up. I don't know if it came up in the feedback. I don't, I don't think we've discussed it. I don't recall hearing it, but I don't think we've heard any like good argument against it. So um, it might be worth pulling some of that language forward and just dropping it in under view quarters and vistas. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. Does anybody else have any comments? Okay. 
Um, any attendees? Oh, I see a hand. Um, Matt. Good evening. How y'all doing? Hey, Matt. Um, so yeah, Joe, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the night sky, dark sky. Uh, that should be a guiding principle for those of us who grew up in Curzay. We used to have beautiful vistas of our night skies. Um, so many of the new residents like to keep their porch lights on or have lights out on all the time. It really dampers. Um, and I think one of the goals should be to get international dark sky community recognition through the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, it's really prominent um, in many places that are tourist driven. So uh, the county should absolutely pursue that. Um, and it should be either in the guiding principle or in the goal. Um, I would love to see a table that shows green space and park or trail access per resident or per capita over time. Um, so Curze has grown exponentially. Uh, green space, trails, uh, ball fields haven't kept up. So I'd like to uh, I'd like this document to, to document um, the depreciation of access to recreation. Uh, for those of us who grew up here. Um, so that's just um, available for everybody to know. Um, also, the map still doesn't show neighborhood parks and gathering spaces. So if we're going to show all the park space in Crozet, it should show all the little um, community uh, playgrounds or dog parks that have been built in all of the newer neighborhoods. Um, and then the so the county can fully recognize that the older neighborhoods that have all the infill developments still don't have access to parks. Um, and the county isn't doing anything to improve that. So if that map doesn't have that, it doesn't accurately reflect um, the green space that's available in Crozet. Um, also, there really needs to be some accountability in this. Um, what is this, like the third or fourth iteration of the Crozet Master Plan? Um, you know, I reached out to Tim and a bunch of y'all, and um, I asked for specifically the 2010, what was proposed and what was actually accomplished by the county. Um, you know, I will respond, but I, I think you're, the answers that were provided were insignificant, um, I would say misguided or misunderstood. I think there's a lot of things, you can't say something's completed when only half of it was done. Um, so I'd like to see some accountability to show what was promised to the community in previous master plans and whether or not the county followed through with it. Um, you know, we talk about the Western Park repeatedly. Well, that was supposed to be funded already in the previous master plan. And I think the county needs to acknowledge that they failed the residents of Crozet um, by putting that in this document. So that's my comment so far. Thanks, Matt. Any other committee members or attendees before we move to the next one? Dan, Dan Mahone would like to speak. Okay. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Hey, friends, neighbors, colleagues, people. It's good to see you. Um, I, uh, I've got a couple of comments. Um, uh, some I'm going to write and follow up with later. But one thing that that um, really stands out to me is the um, I don't see the connection by Corey Farm and, and uh, Liberty Hall in the plan anymore. And um, that was something that we have an easement for. It's dedicated. Um, people are using it. And um, I recently met with a number of folks in Cory Farm and they um, have, have um, after all these years, shown a great deal of interest. And a lot of people are finding their way across the creek in that area and creating warns areas. It would be nice to focus, focus that and, and make it more intentional. I just wanted to put, but it wasn't in the plan at all. And, and I know that when something's taken out of a plan, it can disappear. Um, you know, from, you know, any future uh, investment or, or uh, interest. So that was one that really stood out. And is there a reason that it was taken out? Hello? Uh, Tim or Michaela, maybe you can answer that. No, hi, Dan. Great to hear from hey, you. Hey, hey, Tim. Um, and I, I agree that's an important connection there along the King Hole Creek. Um, I'm not perfectly tuned into like the exact segment you're referring to or um, the part that was in 2010's plan, but not in this plan. Mm -hmm. um, if we I have was, an easement. We ahead. already have an easement. Well, then we'll have to look at that more closely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. 
Okay, cool. Um, and then the other is uh, the, the statement of, of looking to make connections beyond uh, Crozet out into the rural areas to our rural parks and, and other um, destinations. And um, for, a, uh, for a number of years, I've spoken with uh, a lot of folks about um, establishing a bike route along the 76 bike route currently as it is and just simply naming it the Crozet Tunnel Trail. Um, it's the only route, bikeable route I've found uh, after years of poking around and trying to find a way up there. Still haven't found a pedestrian way up there, but but um, that exists and it it, um, it is something that I think would be a very simple um, simple thing to do, but just name that trail, maybe even find out from 76 bike route if you can co-locate a little sign on those signs that exist that say this is the route to um, uh, the tunnel. Just, um, I've been up there observing folks, everyone asks, you know, how can we get to Crozet? And that's the only way that I know is that bikeable route. And that's all I have for now. I'm going to write. I've got some more comments and, and questions that I'll follow up with later. It's great to see everyone. Thanks so much, Dan. That's really helpful. I'm glad you um, looked over that. Uh, Anne, did you want to go ahead? Thank you. I wanted to appreciate the comments about the constructed wetland on Crozet Avenue because it is a very secret jewel and a tremendous draw for wildlife. We still need some more uh, Eagle Scout projects to put in benches and other places for people to rest down there and more trails. But that is a really important stormwater feature for the, the hardscape elements of, of downtown Crozet, but also a really wonderful bridge to the uh, native stuff. The dark skies comments are terrific. And someone did circulate to the board about the international dark sky legislation. It may have been you, Matthew. And I really think that's a grand idea to have a goal to go for. It may unlock that issue from our sort of um, waiting list, which it's on right now. The uh, I other enlisting the uh, Lickenhall Bridge is a wonderful way to show that it's a combined trail across a very treacherous and steep slope as well uh, as to help bring focus on the need to get the bridge done. So I'll just drop that for people to think about. And uh, certainly getting, I know there was some discussion about rerouting the 76 over Greenwood Station, the upper part there to get people off of 250 for a longer time, but that's way beyond my skill set. So I'm really glad we're thinking of getting people out to the tunnel because and getting people from the tunnel and from the AT down into Crozet is another really important thing to work on. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Anne. Um, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Allie. So uh, again, Mark McKenney, uh, look forward to working with everyone. I have one question, because um, I'm drinking by the fire hose here. So forgive me if my question doesn't directly correlate to the um, master plan stuff we're discussing tonight, but it has to do, um, ties in the transportation topic next as well. So what is there, and, and I'm okay with this not being answered until after we kind of go through the transportation piece. What is the risk as we look at some of the master plan and the growth to the loss of some of these trails. Um, as an example, um, the Eastern Ave Connector Road project that has been decades and works, it goes right over um, the Crozet Trail in between West Hall and Westlake. Um, so with the development of some of these future roads and expansions, what's the risk to some of these trails? Uh, so that's my question, uh, but I don't expect an answer right now, I just want to throw that out there as we go through the next chapter. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, that's definitely important. I'm not 
I can't remember all the maps right now if there's a map of like future roads and future trails overlaid um, or, you know, trails existing and future ro roads um, that might uh, spell that out a little bit. Um, all right, anybody else? Um, I don't know who's who's speaking next, but you guys can move on. It's Rachel, so I'll, um, I can keep sharing, Rachel. Okay, great. Thank you, Michaela. Evening, everyone. I'm Rachel Falkenstein. I work with Michaela and team on our long-range planning projects. I'm going to do a similar presentation that Michaela did and just provide a high-level overview of the chapter. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Michaela. I'll start similar to the way Michaela did and talk a little bit about some of the engagement and the feedback we received that led to the draft content before you. Um, so in phase one, we were doing our in-person feedback and we focused uh, on some topics around transportation, really identifying destinations within Crozet where people are traveling to mostly within Crozet to think about how we should prioritize connectivity and routes. Um, and we had some feedback too about and, and some good discussion about how people do get around currently, but how they wish to get around in the future with Jose. Um, and then in phase two, we got a little more focused in our conversations and, and broke topics down into bike ped, roadways and transit and had some virtual workshops on those. Also in phase two, we did a traffic study with a uh, traffic engineering firm EPR, um, and that is still ongoing. We don't have the final report yet, but we do have all the data, and that led into some of the recommendations in this chapter. Uh, we also did a parking study as part of our agreement with um, the developer of Jose Square. We are doing a downtown parking study to try and understand parking needs for that future redevelopment of the area. So that informs some of the recommendations in this chapter as well. And then we got into phase three and we're doing uh, work sessions on some of the draft recommendations. We did work sessions in January and February on the topics of transportation and brought some concepts to you all for your feedback and also mirrored that content online. So moving forward to the next slide, um, some summary of the feedback uh, we did in phase three online. Um, similar to Michaela, we had quite a to the, what Michaela said, we had quite a few just um, open-ended comments on topics, but some themes that emerged from that were really focused on bike ped. People want, wanted to see a prioritization of sidewalks, pedestrian infrastructure, especially in our older neighborhoods of Crozet, and then non-vehicular routes for cyclists and pedestrian safety. Um, so we had two questions we asked two people to answer. One was about the, um, the downtown intersection improvements that we had shared. Uh, we had two options. One was a quadrant and one we called the big circle. And there was a slight preference for the quadrant. Uh, I think mostly because that intersection had the least amount of impacts on the adjacent properties and businesses downtown. Um, and then we had a question about prioritizing sidewalks, and we had four kind of four streets in the downtown area that really rose to the top where we should prioritize sidewalk infrastructure. So moving on to the transportation chapter itself, it's a similar uh, sequence of topics that we had in the conservation chapter, starting with an overview and some background and then getting into the maps. Um, we have a bike and pedestrian network map and we have a future street network map that I'll show here in a bit. And then we get into some intersection improvement recommendations, some street types, and then recommendations for transit. And then the last page of the chapter, similar to conservation, covers the guiding principle, goals, and recommendations for transportation. So moving on to the guiding principle, uh, this should look familiar to most of you. Uh, we, we developed this after the early feedback from phase one and two to create a multimodal transportation network that is safe and accessible for all community members, regardless of age, race, income, and ability. And so moving forward into the chapter, we have uh, at the beginning, our first map is the bike and pedestrian network. And we led with that map because we heard this should really be prioritized in Crozet and it's really important to you all. Um, so on this map, you can see in existing facilities are in solid lines and future recommended facilities are dotted lines. 
And there is a bit of overlap from our conservation network map because we are showing trails and shared use paths on this map as well because they do form uh, part of the bike and pedestrian network in Crozet and they serve, they can serve a transportation function. Um, if there's not a safe on-street facility for bikes or walkers, there might be a trail to get from place to place. So that is carried forward on this map as well. And you can see there's a good network of bike and pedestrian facilities in Crozet, but there are some clear gaps that really need to be um, be built to create some important connections and um, complete the network in Crozet. So moving forward to um, the bike lanes and rural shared roads, I'll highlight these because uh, we, we haven't talked about them much yet. Um, so in addition to shared use paths, we also have facilities recommended for bicycles on street. And so there are two types of on street facilities for bicycles. One is the bike lane. And these are typically on street pavement markings that dedicate an area of the street for a cyclist separate from uh, vehicular traffic. And so there are, there are streets in Crozet that have bike lanes recommended on them. You typically see these on streets that have a little bit higher of a traffic volume where you wanna keep the cyclists separate from the cars. In the neighborhood streets, you typically don't see bike lanes because there's a pretty low volume of cars and it's, it's safer for cyclists to share the road. Um, so we have proposed bike lanes on Three Notched Road, portions of Three Notched Road, portions of Crozet Avenue, mostly the northern per portion from downtown north, Park Ridge Drive, and then Eastern Avenue. The portions that are already built have bike lanes and the future portions are recommended for bike lanes. We also have a facility recommended called a rural shared road. And these are roads that um, might start in the development area or start at the edge of the development area and lead off into the rural areas. So they wouldn't necessarily have curb and gutter or sidewalks on them, but they might provide important connections to amenities in the rural area that people might wanna to get to on their bikes. And so there are types of facilities that could be on a rural shared road, would be a wide sidewalk for a cyclist to use. And that is the recommended and preferred facility. However, there might be areas of roadway that are too narrow or have constraints where we can't widen the road and there could be a shared lane and a signage to, to show that that's a shared route. So the image shows those two, those two types of shared facilities. And rural shared roads are recommended to connect to Mid Springs Park and also from Crozet to Bike Route 76 on the transportation map. So moving along, the next map in the transportation chapter shows our future street network. And the, the colors indicate different types of streets in Crozet. So red streets are local streets blue streets are avenues, and then orange streets are rural transition streets. There's a few of those, uh, Crozet Avenue being one. And then 250 is an arterial. And so the next portion of the uh, chapter talks about what each of these street types uh, means. A local street is, again, the majority of the, the network in Crozet, which are streets typically within neighborhoods. They're really mostly for people within the neighborhoods to get to and from their homes they don't see a ton of through traffic typically. Avenues are uh, typically higher volume streets because they carry um, quite a bit of traffic because they connect destinations. And so typically avenues are those that have dedicated bike facilities on them, either a bike lane or a shared use path. And then arterials, uh, the only one in Crozet is 250. It's really a high capacity roadway and it typically connects multiple towns or cities um, and uh, 250 in Crozet, it forms the southern border of the uh, development area of Crozet. And then moving on, we have our goal section of the plan is kind of the last portion of the chapter. And there are three goals relating to transportation. Uh, one is about just generally creating complete streets and a complete street network. Second is dedicated to sidewalks, paths, and safety for those users. And then third is focus on transit. And so um, the next slide shows all of these goals. Again, that, that text is too small for you to see, but I hope you have a chance to um, go and read through these. I'll highlight a couple that have generated uh, quite a bit of discussion and um, 
uh, comments from previous uh, feedback opportunities we've had. Um, so if you can move forward. The first is a recommendation for our downtown intersections. Um, so this is the that quadrant topic that we talked about and some of the intersection improvements within and around downtown to, to complete that network downtown and help help the network work better. And um, we have a, an image, a couple of images in the plan that show what these would look like. So if you can move forward, Michaela. The first is an aerial showing showing all the recommended intersection improvements. So the quadrant is, if you can see the roundabout on Crozet Avenue at Library Avenue where Michaela's cursor is, it would be to construct that roundabout and then the street going to the west over to Carter Street and then creating a block there. Um, that's the quadrant intersection that I had mentioned. So that's one of the recommended improvements. Another recommended improvement is High Street from um, the Crozet Square down to Tabor Street and adding sidewalks along that street, improving that street, adding curb and gutter and sidewalks. Um, and then I believe that, yeah, I believe that's all the downtown one. There's one other recommendation to extend Dunvegan, but it's not shown on this image, but it would connect Dunvegan over to Crozet Avenue. And then this just shows a street view of what Crozet Avenue would look like. You would be standing in the street looking north in this image. And this is that roundabout that would form a part of the quadrant intersection with Library Avenue and the extension over to Carter Street. Another recommendation I'll point out is the Route 250 roundabouts. Uh, our traffic study found that this is one of the problem areas of Crozet. And it, it, we heard from you all anecdotally that you've experienced this. And so three roundabouts are recommended along 250, one at the intersection of Old Trail and 250, one at the school's entrance, and then one at Crozet Avenue and 250. And the hope is that this will improve the traffic flow, especially um, during rush hour and as schools are um, letting in, letting out and starting in the morning. And then the last recommendation I'll highlight is three notched road shared use path. Um, the recommendation is to construct a shared use path in phases on the eastern portion of Three Notched Road, connecting the Highlands and Wickham Pond neighborhood uh, into downtown. The first phase being to connect those two neighborhoods to Park Ridge Drive. And that would provide a cyclist route uh, all the way to downtown once the connection is made on Park Ridge Drive, because that road is uh, a lot a lot more friendly to cycle on and even portions of it have a bike lane on it already. And then the second phase would extend that shared use path even further into the Star Hill area um, and it wouldn't transition at that point to an on-street uh, bike lane. And so we have an image uh, in the plan, in the draft plan currently that shows this is the Star Hill area. It shows sidewalks and street trees being added to this portion. We want to revise this image to show how it would transition to a shared use path uh, east of here. So hopefully we'll have an updated image uh, in the next draft of the plan. And that is all for my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And Kevin McDermott here is here as well. So hopefully we can answer if there are any technical questions. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Looking good, and I appreciate all the all the work getting all that together. Um, does anybody have any feedback or questions? I have one question. Sure. Um, I was just curious if the um, image about the intersection of downtown Crozet at Library Avenue is that been. Is that just one option or are there others that are still under, is it an example or has that been decided? And then I guess I really have two questions. I was surprised that you didn't include the image of the three roundabouts on Route 250. I saw the paragraph that referenced it, but I was just curious if that was going to be added or there was a reason it was left out. Thank you. So I'll start and then I might punt it to Kevin. Uh, for the downtown, the intent is that the design comes later. This was just a concept that worked well with the traffic study. We don't know exactly what the design will look like. Um, and there'll they'll be quite a bit more work for that. But it does, it does convey the quadrant intersection that we 
um, talked about at previous meetings. Um, so that roundabout would be a portion of that. And then the 250 roundabouts, we didn't include that image because it was uh, it was not a high quality image. We didn't think it uh, fit well in the plan and quite a bit of more work needs to be done to kind of figure out how those roundabouts will work with the surrounding properties. So we didn't do an additional image of that. That was our reasoning for leaving it out. Thank you. Thanks. I I don't know who, who got their hand up first, but Michael, Joe, and then Mark. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed reading this. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, one, what you kind of answered, um, but uh, I was curious about bike connectivity um, with the planned shared use path along Three Notched um, to Park Ridge. I noticed there wasn't a, a future bike lane or future shared use path along most of Park Ridge there. Uh, but based on what you were just saying, it sounds like um, that's because Park Ridge is just amenable to bikes inherently. Um, but I, I would, any, any more clarity on that would be awesome. Um, I also uh, know that there is a small chunk of sidewalk uh, that would be wonderful to have along Three Notch Road connecting to Parkview, um, which is right along that planned shared use path. Um, and I don't know if that incorporates into the shared use path or not. Um, but, um, oh, and I, I also wanted to add, I, I know you didn't necessarily linger on this, but um, I really appreciated the information from the parking study um, about, about downtown parking. Uh, I thought that was really uh, useful data and really interesting. So yeah, thank you. Uh, that's it. Thanks, uh, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Allie. Um, and thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I thought this was a, this was a great draft and um, uh, uh, Kevin and, and everybody presented this. I thought this was great. Uh, three, I had three sort of specific just kind of ideas, suggestions, thoughts, and then one question. I think it's actually for Anne, probably. Um, one is, let's see. Um, I know it was a super small thing that we talked about, but in the Three Notch Road, Crozet Avenue, and there's the reference that we don't have room for a, for a roundabout and all that. I do recall when we had that conversation, there was that, I know, Ali and I think Sean both suggested striping for pedestrians. I know it's mm -hmm. a super small thing, but it's a tiny improvement. Just maybe oh. might be worth mentioning because it did come up and it seems like kind of a no brainer. Uh, and pretty easy and one of those accountability things we can check off pretty easily. Um, and then in the guiding principles, um, one thought was the, the last point that Michael made about parking. I, I thought that was great, the stuff from the parking study. And I know that uh, you mentioned, Rachel, this is still ongoing. Um, I, I just, since there's so much weight often given to these guiding principles in terms of prioritization, it seems that we may want to add something in there in the parking, maybe when the parking study is done, or if we get more information, if we're able to put something in the guiding principles, some recommendation ideas, so, sort of concrete like action items, you know, pursuing joint uh, agreements with private owners, you know, pursuing whatever, well, you know, something like that. If we, if, if things, tangible things come out of that parking study that we can really nail down, I think that might be helpful to put those in the guiding principles. Second, kind of similarly in terms of like specificity in the guiding principles in 2E, there is a reference to sidewalks in downtown neighborhoods. Given, Rachel, the data that you showed about the prioritization where people really wanted those sidewalks focused, it might be helpful to list that out. Because I noticed like 2D really goes into specifics about like, here's where we want the shared use paths and exactly where they're going to go. It might be helpful just for priority purposes to add a similar thing in 2E and say, here's where specifically prioritization, yes, downtown neighborhoods, like, I mean, certainly we'd like St. George and all those places, yes, like a lot of those older neighborhoods need it too, but it seems pretty clear from the feedback we've been getting that the main priorities are Hilltop, Tabor, Park, you know, connecting the park to downtown and all around there. So maybe something like that, like particular priorities on those areas since they seem to show up a lot. And then the last thing, and this is kind of with Anne too, I, I appreciated the, the reference to Avenue and the autonomous shuttles. I thought that was really cool information that was in there. And I see that there's a reference to developing transit plans with routes. My question really is for Ann, where is the Avenue? I, I thought, did the county buy the Avenue? I, I thought my recollection was that the county bought Avenue or what's, where, where is it? 
Shall I go ahead now? Okay, very good, thank you. So uh, this was a funded pilot research project that the county put in some money to, which was a small part compared to what the company and the Department of Transit and, uh, and UVA put in to as a show us that it really can work. And so I would love to have had it going forever, but it is, it's ended, reached the end of its first phase pilot project and was, was basically raised this capability all across the country with when it was presented at other uh, conferences, et cetera. <laughs> so while it is definitely something which can come back and, and the company certainly desires to bring it back, we have not worked that out yet. But it is an important capability. I think people fell in love with the idea of being able to go downtown to the barbershop and not have to do anything else but jump on. That, that's terrific. So that's the answer I have for that. On the uh, striping of the pedestrian things, I will follow up again with Carrie Shepard and find out what our exact process would need to be for that. I think there is some analysis that would need to be done, but I agree some paint would be really great. And it's something the neighbors have been asking for for a long time there. So since we have a new person in the seat that may help us to get that going along. And I'll just throw in my question then you can get to an answer whenever you want. Um, since some of the revenue, there are revenue sharing projects, I think on this list. And so is the Lickenhole Bridge listed somewhere that I just missed? Because I don't want us to forget that since 1992, we've been needing that and it provides pedestrian as well as bicycle, as well as vehicular crossing uh, in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I always like to bring that connection forward. I think it's really important. Um, I'll let Mark go and then I have some comments myself. Thanks. Um, so uh, maybe for Rachel to answer or anyone else in the group. So we're doing a lot of data collection right now, traffic studies, parking studies, data. Is there a concern that these data numbers we're pulling are gonna be skewed simply because of COVID and depending when over the past, you know, six months to a year um, that the, the numbers we're going to see aren't really reflecting the, the traffic and parking issues in Crozet. As an example, um, I think the 2019 VDOT report, Crozet Ave from 250 to Three Notch Road, you know, averaged 7,900 vehicles a day. So I'm kind of curious to see as we gather all this data, because the data is going to help Ms. Malik in the county earmark money and, and revenue sharing projects. Is that data going to be skewed that may not actually reflect uh, what we're trying to solve here? Thanks. So uh, Kevin or Rachel, have a, any reassurance? Uh, yeah, I can respond to that. I, I wasn't sure if I was waiting to the end on questions. Um, <laughs> The data for both, uh, so the data for the parking study was collected in January 2019. They went out and did traffic count. So that was pre-COVID information that formed the parking study. For the traffic study, they did start the study after COVID, but they knew that the numbers would be skewed. So they used previous counts. And maybe Kevin, do you have any more detailed information on, on where the data source is on that? Yeah, sure. The um, so the a lot of those intersections that we analyzed for the traffic study had been counted within two years between 2018 and, and 2020. And so they used those numbers and then they uh, used rates of growth that based on historical rates of growth to figure out what it would be in 2020. And, and then they also used similarly, they used that to extend it out into the future so we knew it. So uh, we did recognize that, that we wouldn't want to do any counts because of COVID and we used other methods to, to get that data. And most of it was based on very recent data uh, in almost all cases. Uh, the, the report will go into a, a much more detail on how they came up with that. But we reviewed it internally, VDOT reviewed it, and we all uh, agreed that it was, it, the data was uh, 
was good, was valid. Oh, that's, that's good. I'd hate for us to do all this work and <laughs> make mistakes somewhere. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I just um, lost my train of thought, but I, uh, I wanted to just say that I, I, I hope that the, as far as the transportation that um, the intersections that are already failing, you know, get emphasized as far as priority, um, because as much like, as beautiful and nice as the downtown improvements are, like I, I just hope that the ones that are already failing on 250 are, are um, sufficiently prioritized in the in the plan. Um, and then uh, also, just wanted to, um, as far as like the sidewalk projects prioritization, I'm not sure what how much of that is actually going into the plan, um, as far as like an order of, you know, the wish list, but. Um, I'm a little hesitant, like when you've put up the numbers from the public input and there's 55 or 71 respondents to a survey, I would go ahead and call those votes. Um, you know, but we actually had more people than that at that meeting who didn't get to vote. Um, so I just um, hope that when we prioritize those projects, like the CCAC feedback is also factored in, even though the public input numbers make for a really pretty graphic. Um, I, um, you know, we heard a lot of other um, feedback in the meetings and, um, and through e emails and stuff. So just wanted to bring those, those forward. Um, I see one attendee hand up, but I want to make sure everybody on the committee has got a chance to chime in. All right, we can go ahead with Matt then. Yeah, um, a couple things. One is Eastern Avenue. Uh, due to the inability of the county to, to finish that construction, it's been turned into a basketball court, skate park, food truck hub. And I don't see any, um, I, don't, I don't see the county addressing how that's turned into a very important community recreation site. I could either be in the previous section or this section, but the completion of Eastern Avenue um, that asset needs to be replaced in that community. Otherwise, there won't be any place for the kids and the, and the families to go. Uh, question, why isn't Crozet Avenue and Avenue all the way at least to Crozet School? Why does it stop uh, in the middle of Crozet? Um, I would like to see uh, suggested timelines and uh, estimated costs, uh, obviously $21 uh, for total build out of the transportation plan. I mean, if you're putting in something that's going to be you know, $300 million in construction costs, um, that's never going to happen in Crozet. So I'd like to see how realistic some of these plans are um, with current costs. Um, and then I would love to see some commentary about public arts or statues, you know, Rita Mae Brown characters or bronze peaches or apples in these proposed roundabouts. Um, we have a lot of great potential there and I'd love to see that included in the plan. Thanks, Matt. Um, appreciate the preparation and good ideas. Joe? Yeah, so actually just a, a question for staff. Um, and maybe Rachel, uh, this gets to like the implementation side, but is is the, looking back at the 2010 plan to pick up on Matt's point about like implementation and timelines, is is the implementation section gonna continue to have the like short-term, mid-term, long-term timelines in there? Is that gonna be in the implementation section or somewhere um, in the plan? Is that gonna be retained? Yes, we will do that work. And that's actually our next step um, okay. to talk about implementation. Um, cool. we, I know we had some questions previously about prioritization on a couple of topics and that, that helped us kind of formulate, you know, what types of facilities and uh, what types of roads things should be. But we need to do more of that work and think about it more holistically in terms of prioritization. So that's kind of our next step of work with all of this. So we'll, we'll come up with some cost estimates. We'll talk through you know, what's realistic timeline for some of these projects, you know, given where we, given where we are as a county and it has to be prioritized countywide and kind of come back to you and hear your feedback on where we should focus, you know, our first steps to implement this plan. So uh, there's, there's been quite a bit of uh, uh, questions about that. And I think, I hope that our next kind of iteration or, or group of work and input will kind of get at some of those questions that we've heard this evening. Thanks. 
né? Just a question on my end, um, since I'm kind of a community engagement person, um, was curious about uh, access for the committee and the public about the feedback that was being collected online. Um, I'm just really curious to see what, you know, what the, the breadth of the responses are. I mean, it's great to see what the, the data that you're presenting at the beginning of, I'm wondering if there's like just like raw data that could be kind of like look through quickly to see. But I'm just curious to what other threads are popping up or if there's anything else that, that you know, we can need to be thinking about that may not, you know, come to the top, but it's some kind of outlier that'd be like, oh, that, that's an interesting conversation that, that maybe should be brought forward. Um, I would love to be, have access to that and review it um, just to help feed ideas and, and conversation. I can jump in on that. Um, if you, I can send out the link that the main um, Crozet Master Plan Hub has reports at the bottom underneath the online like forms that you can fill out. And um, this like online website doesn't aggregate like combine different forms, but you can click and see the same reports that we look at. They just have names removed from them. And there's no, like, I'm just curious too, there's no like um, either opt-in, opt-out kind of like demographic data on that. I know, I know, I know there's people, like when you look on it online, you can see people's names if they decide to do them, but I'm just curious about um, if we're collecting any kind of like, you know, who's responding kind of in general. Yes, we did add those questions kind of um, not at the very, very initial like our first uses of public input, um, it's definitely very important data, but the later forms have it. And perhaps we've been working with our Office of Community Engagement to, um, I think, you know, Serena to put this together. And we might have that part hidden from the public, I, but we did collect it on several forms. And I think that should be shared so um, we can take a look at that and figure out how to back in. I guess I'd also just like to clarify, like, I've, I'm spending a lot of time at these meetings and, you know, over the last year, personally, um, working on this. And should I also, you know, should I also be reiterating my opinions on public input? As I feel like I'm already have, I already have this this forum, but uh, the way you guys are using the data, it seems like I should be going back in and and uh, inputting all of my opinions there too. And along with everybody else on the committee. So we've been taking notes and capturing feedback from the CAC. So I don't think you need to reiterate things that have, are said in this meeting. But one thing I will say, especially with the draft chapters, if there are like detailed comments that we just didn't have time to get to in this meeting, I think it would be appropriate for you all to go on and make those comments through public input. Um, we also get comments through email. Not everyone's comfortable using the technology or they just wanna send off an email. We're capturing that as well. So it's not the only way for people to participate. And we're definitely listening during these meetings and trying to fold in you, your commentary and the discussion from the meeting as well. Thanks, I just, I, the parts that I get hung up on are the questions on public input that are like votes or, you know, do you, yes or no questions or, you know, or priorities or something. And I'm not going there because I'm here, um, but, I, but I will take that time if, if that's where my vote's gonna actually be tabulated if that makes sense. And that hasn't been clear throughout the process. I sort of felt like I would be double voting if I went into public input and said all my things. So, cause I've, I've already expressed a lot of my personal opinions at, at these meetings. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of clarify that at this point. And we have been trying our best. I know it's difficult because it doesn't always translate because this is a conversation versus public input being static, but we've been trying to mirror the comment, the, the uh, uh, questions as best we can on public input. So a good one is that quadrant versus um, big circle. 
we asked you all that as well. And this group tended to favor the quadrant as well. So yeah, you know, we mirrored that online. So yeah, yeah going on and then, voting. And then there's no, like when you put it on like in a specific mathematical graphic, I, you know, it's our, our is my vote in there i guess i mean i don't really care i like both you know the quadrant i'm not hung up on that i just you know i just um i just want to clarify how how the data is really being you know if there wasn't a chart and it was just a sort of general idea then i would feel a little more comfortable but when i start seeing charts and graphs with numbers i'm wondering how you know how my how my feedback got got included that's all that's fair. And those charts are generated by public input. So we use them because it's easy, but yeah. it's not like a, it's, it's not a queen, like, oh, 90% said this. So we're definitely doing that. It's more just informing rather than a, a voting situation. Thanks. I'll just add on and say like that we definitely value both written and like spoken feedback as well as we haven't done as much as we'd like to virtual, but creative formats as well. So um, hear you on that, Allie, though, if anyone, while you're participating here, you have later comments that you want to jump in online and like add to that, because I don't know, our thinking isn't just like available right as soon as we receive information. I wouldn't be like concerned that you're double counting feedback or something like that. Um, and if you didn't answer a question while we're in this conversation, but you'd like to weigh in, that's another option. It's just multiple options for people. Can I, can yeah. I, just, yeah. I was just gonna to add to, and then Joe's comment about, because some of you are so good at referencing the, the 2010 master plan. Does the, does the commenting, like, is it, arch, is it archived someplace where in future manifestations of master planning processes that can, it, can be, it can be accessible or is that being thought about at all in terms of the engagement side of things? I think this is very emergent, like moving to fully virtual and uh, it's something we need to think about in terms of like adoption of the plan and how to put this material together. So I don't have an answer on that right now, but it's a good, good thought and good question. Right, I think I saw Mark's hand first and then Sandy. Yeah, um, I kind of want to, I want to add a, a couple comments after Joe's uh, kind of timeline. I, I think it's very important that we manage expectations uh, with many of these projects. Um, none of it's going to happen overnight. And I think I'm kind of, Again, I apologize because I'm, I'm drinking by the fire hose here. So I'm kind of interested to see how, how do these projects that we're talking about with the sidewalks, the roundabouts, I know some of it's revenue sharing with, with VDOT, you know, and, and Rachel, I know you mentioned you're going to kind of lay things out in a short, medium, long-term timeline, but how do we make sure that some of these projects are aligned in the capital improvement project plans. I know uh, from the VDOT side, the, I believe what's it, the, the smart scale, you know, how, how long is it going to take to get a roundabout put in from, from a timeline uh, five years from now type of a thing? Because my concern is, and in, in maybe even this more from the planning commission side, you know, I'm going to use Crozet Park as an example, okay, that's probably, project's probably going to get done, my thought is years before some of these sidewalks get put in, okay, um, or, or the square gets done before some of these sidewalks get in. So, so as I'm talking out loud and asking a question, how do these projects correlate to capital improvement project timelines, some of the VDOT timelines for revenue sharing, and all the planning commission zoning packets coming in for the square, the, the park, because it kind of seems that nothing's ever going to catch up to each other, if that makes sense. And I'm kind of kind of like to see what a process would, would look like as we capture all of all of these, because look at the, the park in Old Trail, 
um, Eastern Ave, you know, we're, we're decades beyond these things happening and where do they fit in priorities? Thanks. I can take that question. Thanks. Um, so after the after the the master plan is approved and we have these list of projects that are prioritized, uh, then that that then it comes to the next step where we look uh, generally on sort of an annual basis, but but sometimes biannually it countywide how projects how we want projects to move forward and when we're doing that we take into account the the CIP and the cycles of grants that are available for all of these including smart scale revenue sharing transportation alternatives um, and and we work with finance and budget and the board of supervisors to identify usually a schedule that looks out a, a you know up to maybe six years and try and start planning forward with each of those projects. Um, you're right, they all do take time, but we slowly move through these things. Like say Eastern Avenue, we'll take that as an example. Um, and I know it's it's been on the plans for a long time. Uh, I, I've been here at the county for four years and uh, it's been you know a super high priority since I got here. And we've slowly tried to pick away at it. We tried to get funding a number of times now we've moved forward with design and we're doing design with the intent of going for a revenue sharing grant in this cycle, in this next round, which is this year. Um, and so we had to get approval from the board. We had to work that into the CIP. And if we get the, the construction funding in approved in this next round, then you know we're probably still looking at five years before that thing finally gets constructed. Uh, major projects take that long. Uh, it, the roundabouts will take that long, but we focus on the highest priorities and we work with the county um, office of management budget and the board of supervisors to really lay out that schedule. Uh, the important step we're in right now is just let's get it into the plan. And then we look at you know, those highest priorities from this plan in relation to all the priorities that around the county and look at our budgeting and cycles and, and work through it. So, so that's, and, and the, so the major projects will go for smart scale on, for the smaller ones, we'll try revenue sharing or possibly just fund them straight out of the CIP for smaller sidewalk projects. And, and, and CIP funding means it can go much faster Smart scale federal funding means that it's going to take a long time uh, because they have long lags between uh, even just getting funding approval and being able to start construction. Does that does that answer your question, Mark? That absolutely answers my question. I think that's also very important for a lot of other people to understand, um, especially on the Eastern Half topic. You know, so thank you for that. So I guess now at the We'll dial it back down to the county level. Again, I think one of my immediate concerns is the square and the Crozet Park, and that's going to be increased traffic already. How do these sidewalks align to when those projects are going to get completed? How does some of the work on Crozet Ave align, align to, to those projects as well? So again, I understand it may not get answered now, but just things to think about as we move forward. Yeah, once again, that that process comes later on. Once these are recommend, recommended in this and they're prioritized in this for your community, when we go to prioritize the projects, we look at a lot of factors and, I, and, and there's actually a document online you can check with the Albemarle County transportation priorities. And we look at things like, you know, how land use is causing changes. If there's big projects happening, uh, coming up, or does that make one project uh, more important to get done faster than another project where maybe no development is occurring, uh, and or if there's safety issues or major traffic growth in certain areas, uh, those are factors that we consider once we're really looking at that that short range funding timeline. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, you can go ahead, Sandy. 
Yeah, I just, I guess these are questions for Anne, but maybe questions that other people have. I don't recall a lot of land acquisition by the county. In other words, the county being proactive and just taking a land that's available at a certain period in time, knowing that this community is going to grow, that there's going to be a lot of construction. Um, for example, is the county even looking at acquiring that wooded property that was set to be logged above Mint Springs? Is that is that a possibility? Could the county play some role there? And is there any discussion at the county level of a tax increase? I know when I first moved here, I went to a discussion about um, some cuts that were planned in the public schools, and I was astonished that the parking lot was filled with people and more than 100 people getting up to give testimony that they wanted the taxes raised because they did not want the cuts in schools. And so, you know, <laughs> politicians tend to assume that tax hikes are a bad thing, but as our community gets more and more built out, I would like to see a greater investment on the part of government in some open space. And I don't know that that's happening. I also am concerned, and I'm not sure when the right time is to discuss this, but I feel that if Crozet Park is going to include a very large recreational facility, that some of that park should not be branded a park anymore. As far as I'm concerned with the involvement of ACAC, it's a commercial activity. It's not, it's not green, it's not open space, it's a building in a very large parking lot. So as we master plan, let's keep an eye on that. <clears throat> Um, when is when when is the next opportunity? I don't know where things stand with that whole discussion, but we'll uh, we'll be talking again about plans for Crozet Park. I guess I can let someone else answer, but since they <clears throat> deferred, there will be another opportunity for public comment when they come back with their um, application. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, they deferred to a date uncertain, so. Um, <clears throat> It could be, I would guess it would be at least several months. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't have a discussion about how, like what Kevin was saying, like how we prioritize sidewalks and certain things when we have a park, um, regardless of um, the expansion or not. You know, it seems to me that the area where people might prioritize it, that seems like what your charts and graphs were saying. Um, but also, since that is our community park, not a neighborhood park, um, we want to make ways for the whole community to access that park. So I think it's a, a discussion that we can have in master planning, but as far as the expansion, that would come back to the planning commission, um, and that's between the applicant and staff. Um, and I also just saw in one of the first slides in this in this um, presentation that there are um, different categories of um, of parks and one is recreational, which includes facilities and um, fields, I mean like sports facilities, which includes pools and indoor pools. So I don't really see it as a conflict of the of the green space plan to have to have that facility. That's just I don't want to get off topic, but yeah, I know I, I tend to look at it from an ecological standpoint and with all the construction and all the paving that we're doing, I, I just feel like we're totally out of sync with where the world is right now. I, I think our priority really needs to be much more on acquisition of open space and preservation of, of natural areas. Yeah, I, I think we agree on on a lot of that. Um, I mean, you and I. But... <laughs> on we go. Yeah. Valerie? You're married, darling. Sorry, I was gonna just say exactly what you did, Ali, that, um, you know, parks and recreation, that it's important to balance both, that there's such need in the community for recreational space and play ball fields, play fields, and indoor recreational facilities as well. So thank you. Um, any other committee members that um, haven't gotten a chance to chime in? Um, I guess we can hear from Matt again. 
Yeah, I'm hoping um, Kevin – or not Kevin, but uh, Tim can follow up because as, as far as I'm aware, um, Albemarle County actually hasn't been successful at getting LCWF or RTP grants, and that's because the county doesn't provide matching funds to acquire those lands. Um, I pleaded, begged, pleaded for the county to acquire the last remaining parcel on St. George Avenue for a neighborhood park, and the county flat out refused to do that. $60,000 parcel. Um, we could have done a public-private partnership to develop that in the playground space for the kids. Now we have nothing but the road on St. George for kids to play in. Um, so I'd love for, for, for Tim to speak about LWCF, RTP, or other grants to acquire any lands. Um, because, as, as I said, I'm not aware of the county of acquiring any parklands in the Crozet area um, ever, other than through proffers or donations. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'm happy to respond to that. Um, well, as you just kind of concluded your question and comment, um, you know, a lot of the acquisition of greenways or parkland in the Crozet development area has been in conjunction with um, land development and specifically in conjunction with, you know, what's considered legislative applications and review processes. Um, I think generally kind of in response to what you've raised and what uh, Sandy has raised, it seems like in, in total, the county's focus right now is on the development and improvement of lands that we currently own or control and is not so much focused on additional acquisition or obtaining additional park lands. The exception to that would be, um, you know, continuing to expand and grow the Greenway network. Um, again, that does often happen in conjunction with land development, um, but that seems to be, you know, where, where the low hanging fruit is, where the best opportunities are to grow the network. Um, you know, there are some examples of, of recent uh, significant additions to the Greenway network or even parklands that are basically slated for that natural area typology and not so much slated for actual programming or recreational development. Um, that includes the open space um, from Sparrow Hill or, you know, yeah, Sparrow Hill along a Licking Hole Creek uh, watershed. Um, I also think some of the suggestions that, that came in the last few comments might be the type of work that fits better into like nonprofit and allied organizations, um, specifically conservation easement holders, of which there are many in Virginia and in central Virginia. Um, I don't know that the county is necessarily the, the best actor or best position to hold land and to manage land um, for, for exclusively conservation purposes. Um, there's exceptions to that, of course, but I just wanna point out that it's not necessarily just a local government role to play in terms of open space acquisition or you know, conservation of, of wildlands. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, I see your hand still up, Matt, did you? Yeah, I just exactly. want to say, so So, if Tim could clarify, the county has not allocated a single dollar to acquire any green space or lands. Um, and the, my follow up would be like, yeah, I fully recognize the importance of nonprofits and conservation funds. However, the county designated Crozet a growth area. So therefore, the county really does have responsibility. Um, we had plenty of space before it was built out. We don't now. That, that really falls on the shoulders of the county. Um, and then, yeah, just clarify that zero dollars have been spent acquiring lands. Yeah, I'm not able to confirm or disconfirm that, but I would say I hear uh, what you're, you're raising and I don't disagree. I just don't think, um, you know, as a Parks and Rec staff member, I'm in the best position to talk about the allocation of funds. Um, but I also just, from a technical or, or informational standpoint, don't know that I can actually confirm that we've spent zero dollars on land acquisition. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of second that. My concern is we have all these goals. Now we have climate action um, strategies and so forth for the county, but Sometimes the best way to deal with some of these questions is just to buy the land. We can address it later, but land's only going to get more expensive. And buying a neighborhood park or buying a section of land for 
multimodal transportation or whatever, seems like it ought to be a really high priority for the county. And um, I just don't understand the county's history of either never having done it or doing it really, really rarely. Um, it shouldn't be that the only parks that we're going to have in the future that we don't have now happen to be proffers, which are primarily when builders are jettisoning land that they don't want to pay taxes on that's unbuildable due to um, wetlands or, or steep grades or whatever. So um, I really think that a part of this master plan ought to call for purchasing land. Thanks, Brian. I lost some of your comment there um, because of poor audio, but I think I got the gist. Um, Valerie? Thank you. Well, I don't disagree that there is an important role for the county to play in acquiring land for parks and recreation. I do want to say I think it is very important that there, the priority be on improving those existing properties that already they do own, however they acquired them. Western Park obviously has been mentioned and is way long overdue for funding, but also other areas in the community that um, need additional support. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just pausing in case there's any other any other comments or feedback. Um, I don't, are you guys, um, Anne? I just want to thank people for raising this idea of doing other things outside the box because people may come up with connections that we've never thought of. And there are lots, as Tim mentioned, there are lots of conservation organizations who are also working with landowners trying to find new homes for tax credits for their properties. Um, so while it may not necessarily be county cash, I definitely am interested in learning as much as I can about any and all possibilities. So let's all keep those ideas coming. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew? Just bringing up some thoughts that are coming up in the conversation. I mean, I, I think the one one note that I, I saw in the in the conservation was was the conversation about old Crozet School. Like that, that's a piece of land that's sitting there that you know could be used for something interesting. Um, um, but also thoughts about like having done some watershed work in the past um, and finding really interesting ways to do public private you know partnerships. I, I mean. You sometimes you, you do have to like try to spur the imagination of people to kind of think about what the, what the future might be. And um, I mean, we do have a pretty uh, major architecture school, which I'm a part of um, in UVA and the landscape and just having like ways of like exploring ways that students could kind of imagine or work with the community to imagine opportunities, not that they would be built or anything, but like just to spur conversation and build ideas. I think those would be uh, important collaborations that we could we could we could look toward and try to try to build on um, different ways. So um, you know having done that work myself in the past, like sometimes people don't know what they have until you start to look at it or someone looks at it from a different perspective and then then that spurs new ideas. Um, so I'm all for trying to help perpetuate that in any way that can be possible. Um, I do think that the old Crozet School could be a good um, place to explore more um, park facilities, you know, especially for the underserved St. George area. Um, there could be a new playground there, you know, new field or whatever. Go ahead, Anne, you're already unmuted. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, you probably heard whispering at home here. Um, so I would just like to ask um, Parks to 
provide some information when they can, uh, because there are activities now with the softball activities and things, and there is definitely community gathering space on the south side of the school that is outside the leasehold of the field school. But I don't have all the details of really how much acreage there is. I do know that people are picnicking and playing all the time on that stream side there. So uh, I'm very concerned that it not get away. Um, and I don't, so every time some board member starts talking about, um, oh, getting rid of old county property, <laughs> That seems to be one that they want to go. I said, no, you know, this is where generations of people went to school and it is fully in use. And so um, yeah, I agree. Be sure that it remains as a county asset and that we think of wonderful fun ways to have art festivals there or any number of, you know, of sculpture things or whatever. Um, I think that our imagination is our only limitation on that. So but I really want to be very careful that we don't give any impression that we're interested in developing it for housing or anything like that, because that has been suggested. And I just am very concerned that that be um, very thoughtfully considered. It's outside the growth area and a lot of it's in floodplains. So we just have to be careful. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, I know it's used by Peachtree and so um, soccer league, so. Um, at the very least. Um, was there anything else? We, we did have uh, two more slides about next steps if the committee's done discussing. Yeah. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, well, first I'll talk about the drafts being online. So if you go to publicinput.com slash imagine crozet, you'll come to a hub page that has been kind of the home of our online public input for this project. And there are two boxes at, toward the top that say draft conservation chapter and draft transportation chapter. You can click the blue participate box and that will take you to a page where you can read the draft chapter, um, you can read it in the window, you can download it, or you can actually open up and comment on it. So if you wanna do line by line comments, or there's a particular spot on a map you wanna make a comment on, you can go and do that through public input. Um, so both of those are online right now, they're live. Um, please spread the word to your networks in Crozet. Um, they will be live until April 28th. And after we close them, I'll share if you can go to the next slide, Michaela we will be going to the planning commission with these drafts um, and share the feedback we've heard this evening and the feedback from online and give them an opportunity to weigh in and make recommendations. Um, kind of parallel to that, we're gearing up to, to our next topic, which is implementation, as we've all started to talk about a little bit this evening, and that will be where we will sit down and prioritize all of these recommendations and um, kind of pick the ones that rise to the top that should be our first step of work. And we're trying to plan this as a broader community meeting, so it wouldn't be hosted as a CAC meeting. And doing it that way hopefully will allow us to do um, smaller conversations so we can do breakout rooms in Zoom so you can have a group having a conversation. And hopefully that allows more people to weigh in and gives more people kind of time to speak so that um, everyone gets a chance to uh, talk to staff about the content. So we don't have a date for that, but I'll follow up shortly and let you know when that will be. Um, and then we'll move forward to kind of pulling it all together into a full draft review. And we don't have dates and anything finalized yet on that, but that will begin uh, sometime in June. And that is all we have for this evening. Any questions on uh, any of that information? Um, no, I'm just super excited that we're, um, getting to be stages. It's been a long, long time. I mean, not by anyone's fault, just the pandemic interrupting us. Um, but it's, it's exciting. Um, all right, I think that's it. We, um, we have a few minutes to talk. Um, other business and I wanted to bring up um, last week's um, work session um, 
at the Board of Supervisors on the land use draft. Um, did um, folks get a chance to watch that live or, or record it? And is there any, any thoughts as a committee? An advisory committee? <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I think uh, all of us probably have some substantive responses to the board. Um, starting, you know, I, I think my overall frustration with the with the comments that were made by the board was my my take on this is, of course, it's not a perfect plan. It's not a plan that everybody 100% agrees with, but I think that it very much fairly represents a compromise and a lot of work that went in um, to people who. I think it is a fair representation and a fair compromise between people that are very much no more development and people that want to maximize development. And I think that this fairly captures all that and it represents creative solutions on a part of staff who were very creative and implemented our feedback um, and feedback from the community and from the planning commission in what I thought were effective and creative ways to retain a lot of the increases in density and creative ways to do that. Um, I will also say that I was really frustrated. I'm sure a lot of you were by the, what I perceived to be a really um, condescending uh, tone. That was the word I used. Um, uh, the, the comments particularly from Supervisor Galloway, uh, officially I, I interpret them as being the, that the CACs have, uh, as my grandfather said, gotten too big for our britches. Um, that's kind of, what I heard there. And I was disappointed by that. And so I, I think we were all disappointed. Procedurally, look, we've all invested months and years into this plan, right? We've done meetings and meetings and meetings and in person and forum and talking and phone calls and reviewing the drafts. And so to go through all that work for something that all of us agree is not, we don't agree with every single part of that plan. But then for people who don't live in Crozet, who we don't have the opportunity to vote for, swoop in at the 11th hour and attempt to commandeer the plan, I think people can understand why that would be very frustrating. And, and look, at, and honestly, the last thing I'll say, you know, when Tom Loach, when, when he said a few meetings ago, he said this was the county's plan. I thought that was an inappropriate comment. You know, I said, look, that, I actually thought that was inappropriate. I said, look, when he, when he was referring to staff's work and he said, this is the county's plan, I thought that that was an inappropriate comment. I said, that, that's, no, that's not right. But, you know, if the Board of Supervisors swoops in and does this, I, I mean, it, look, it starts to feel like that in some ways when the board does that. So I don't know. I, I was offended personally, disappointed and offended as a member of this committee who's invested, as we all have, years and staff years into this plan. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I I um I have drafted an email um to the supervisors and I was just sort of um waiting to send it um, till after we had a chance to talk as a group too, because I wanted to see if, um, um, if anybody else had, you know, had um, opinions, but yeah, I agreed that um, it was, it was, um, it was, I was offended and I was also worried um, that, uh, that, that, um, all of our work was being disregarded. And I don't even just mean the committee, I mean, which was a big part of the problem was um, just when um, Supervisor McKeel um, was upset that we had taken votes, um, even though she said that it was all within um, the rules of CACs to be able to take votes and, and then, um, Supervisor Galloway insinuated that we didn't understand that our role was advisory. I mean, we we took those votes and we recorded them in order to clarify and make our input, you know, simpler for people who weren't at the meeting to understand. And I, mean, I thought we did a very careful job summarizing and and there was so much information. We were we were only trying to be um, I don't know, just helpful, you know, constructive um, with all the time that we personally had volunteered for um, this process. So 
Um, and then that, you know, all that aside, I just I really wanted to say thank you to Anne um, for um, speaking up for us. And uh, I think that Anne did a good job, um, you know, correcting a couple of um, of things. Like, I mean, I was especially concerned with the um, supervisor Galloway seemed to think that the middle density was um, a decrease in. Um, potential uh, density where, and in fact, it's an, it's an increase in potential dens density in all of the places it's being applied. So I just, a couple of those things were, were really frustrating to watch. Um, and, I, and I appreciate staff. Um, I mean, I think that you guys did a great job um, and I think that Anne did a great job. So I just, I wanted to hear what the rest of you guys thought about it. And um, I definitely have some feedback to send to the board before their next session. You know, I just, I've, sp I've spent four years on this committee and many years before that attending. And um, I felt very insulted <laughs> by the comments that night or that afternoon, I should say. Um, Doug, I saw your hand up. Did you have something? Uh, yeah, Ali, uh, thanks very much. And I agree very strongly with you and, and Joe and others who have spoken about the frustrations of the of the board action. I did want to, though, uh, reiterate what you said about Anne's comments. She made every point I would hope she would make. She made it clearly, and it was not heard. But anyway, thanks, Anne. Um, and then on another, uh, please, please, um, well, Anne, you can go ahead, but I, um, I don't know if anybody else um, has thoughts. I'd, I'd love for you guys to, to chime in. Go ahead, Anne. Come, ba come back to me later. I'll wait. Um, any other, any other thoughts or thumbs up or anything? <laughs> So I, I'll mention something. I, I would tend to agree. I think being marginalized the way we were is unfortunate. Um, I mean, we were put in place and chartered to provide the role that I think we're filling. And, and it seems like, well, that's great as long as we agree with what somebody thinks that doesn't live in Crozet. Um, but if, if we disagree, then, well, they're not allowed to do that. I mean, I, I just think it's disappointing. Either dissolve the committee and just make what you're going to tell us informational, but don't give us the empowerment to make decisions or, or provide input and then completely disregard them. I, I, think, I think you're right. I think it's very disrespectful. And certainly as supervisors, their obligation is to the, res the citizens of the county and the taxpayers, and that is not... A, a behavior that's consistent with that philosophy either. So, so it, it is disappointing. Um, so interesting to know what they think about the plan in their particular areas, so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think Matthew and then Brian. Yeah, I think um, the thing that came to mind when I was listening to the conversation was this tendency to, to want to to want to like com compare all the growth areas all on the same like level, which which was like how, how can you even like how can you even compare uh, some of these sites? They're just they're just not comparable. Um, I mean, I, I I appreciate the efforts in the plan to kind of like to to kind of try to like uh, bring all the language under under kind of comparable ways like and kind of creating a, a a nomenclature for how planning should happen across those spaces. But they're just not comparable spaces. Um, they're not, you know, there's 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 very different tensions going on. So um, in the different sites, and to recognize that um, was was that was that's what was difficult for me um, to list to listen and hear to hear hear about. Um, so it's like, how do you you know how do you make those present, right? And yeah, I mean, it makes me think about like if if we showed up at you know other sites and started saying you know you can't do that <laughs> like. They would, they would, they would be in the same position. So um, it's like, how do you, how do you bring them into the conversation in a way that allows them to understand that? Which I don't know if there is. So.
Um, Brian? Yeah, I, I just feel, I felt like we were totally insulted and, you know, I put a number of years into this. Some of you put a lot more years into it. And um, I kind of have to go back to Tom Loach and say, you know, if we're not going to be listened to, why do we exist? And there just isn't any excuse for public officials to treat citizens advisors that they've appointed in such a just despicable way. It was just crazy. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, Mark? Yeah, so um, I'm walking into this. Um, many of you have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, but I think we need to exist um, because the second we throw the white flag up, um, there's, there's going to be no one to speak up. Um, so it may not be going our way the entire time, um, but I think we need to ensure that the CAC continues, that not just at CAC meetings, uh, we speak up and the community speaks up, but um, the other public meetings that are happening that when Ms. Malik and the Board of Supervisors convene or Ms. Moore and the Planning Commission convene. Um, so just, just keep your voices heard for the community. Keep, keep speaking up, keep beating the drum because eventually a barrier will be broken and maybe someday the, the culture, the political culture that many of us are not privy to at the county level, um, will, that barrier will be broken. Uh, but there is one thing I do wanna say um, to Rachel, Michaela, Kevin, Tim, and the rest of the county staff. Uh, thank you for all of your hard work. Um, you do great work. Um, and in public administration, you probably get beat up a lot more than you get thanked. So, you know, on record, I'd like to make sure that Gratitude is given to all of the county staff that continues to listen to community members, the CAC, and also have to navigate the county bureaucracy. So again, thank you all for your hard work. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess I just also wanted to say, I think Anne um, has done a good job um, uh, at, you said this at the, at the meeting, at the end of the meeting that, you know, you had, um, made efforts to make the committee, um, you know, a diverse body of opinions. Um, and I think, you know, we've all experienced and, and, you know, witnessed that and I appreciate it. And I think that the, um, you know, I hope that your colleagues on the board, um, appreciate that too. So go ahead, Ann. Thank you. Um, I just, I appreciate all the kind things that were said and what I'm going to sound like Pollyanna here, but we have a ways to go. We have achieved tremendous success and I credit staff tremendously for navigating with us what has been a really challenging discussion, but it's been a challenging discussion among friends who really love their community. And I have repeatedly described to other board members the reason that Crozet is special is because it has descendants of the same people who were here in 1810, and it has thousands of new residents who have all been welcomed in, dragged into public meetings within 12 months or 12 days of getting here because that's the way the community is. And so don't criticize when people are engaged and jump up and down, it's because they care. And that's the one thing that no elected official can create. It's something you are blessed to have if you're lucky enough to have it. But considering where we are now, I was truly alarmed throughout that meeting. And I don't, I don't feel as if I do very well off the cuff like that when there's grenades being thrown right and left. So uh, I think that in the meantime, I would appreciate it if people would think about how to use the positives, defend the numbers because explain 
the middle density is not a decrease. It is actually a 50% increase on what was in those neighborhoods. Um, I'm so appreciative that Charles jumped in, Charles Rapp, when he did, to say, well, the staff worked really hard to balance all the different viewpoints where the rest of the county growth is going and what is needed for this tiny little community out here in relative terms to the other much larger growth areas. Uh, so I think those are points to really emphasize to, because what I really don't want to have is any communication that ends up leaving a bitter taste in any reader's mouth. We can certainly be strong and firm and supportive and say, focus on one thing that you think is fabulous and focus on some things that you think we, it'd be great to, to do more of. And certainly they're hearing a lot about dark skies from lots of different communities. Lots of different communities want sidewalks. Every, 12, 15 years ago, Crozet Growth Area was the only one who had a master plan. And so even though it took 25 years to get a lot of those amenities that are finally done, those are all seen as things by others that, oh, well, Crozet's gotten all the money, right? Well, no, actually. First, they've gotten all the people. And second, they've gotten some projects, which were wonderful. Um, and we have a long way to go to even catch up to the projects which were planned for wisely back in the 90s when a whole lot of rezonings were done based upon Jarman's Gap being done, based upon Eastern Avenue Bridge being done. So um, I, I know that, uh, that people feel disappointed about certain things, but I really encourage you to swallow hard and think about ways that we can get this compromise plan happily adopted because uh, I was truly alarmed by people making comments about how we should have 36 units everywhere. And I had a really hard time biting my tongue about that because I didn't wanna say things that would be, make it worse. I never wanna make it worse. I'm happy to fight for things, but I don't wanna make it worse. So uh, anyway, just, I know that you all have wonderful things to say and I know you will do great, but I just wanted to encourage you to really realize we need four votes to get this adopted. And I don't wanna put, have any jeopardy about that happening. Uh, I did reach out to senior staff and the man I spoke with said, well, he didn't hear, I because I was very concerned about the board thinking that they could just go in there and change things. And he said, well, I didn't hear that. I heard concern, I heard questions, I heard discussion, but I did not hear. And he said, staff will be prepared to defend the recommendations which they are making. And to me, that felt very encouraging. And staff members, I want to encourage you. We've, we've got your back on that. We want you to please be strong and brave because you should be proud of what's where we are right now. Uh, so anyway, we're in this together. We'll get, we'll get through the next little while to get this done. Uh, I hope that we will be able to have a really big open air spring meeting somewhere that we can invite the wider community and very similar to the one that we had at Western the first time because that kind of celebration, I think, would really give everybody great momentum to go forward to the public meetings. But we'll see how that will work out. And that's really the only pep rally speech I had for you today. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I think so, too. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, and I do and I do think that um, if I, I shared your concern, just to try to make this brief, that um, you know, especially in the questions that were specifically posed at the end of the um, session, when several supervisors explicitly requested, I would say, higher densities than, than already increased in this uh, revision, um, I hope that staff will, you know, will stand, with, stand their ground a little bit with all of the work and, um, you know, cooperation and um, thoughtful planning that has has gone into the chapter. So, um, and when Supervisor McKeel said that we were making us a growth area that's different from other growth areas, I was just like, yes, it already is. Of course it is. It's, it's in Crozet. It's not, it's not, um, in the urban ring and it's not the same as Rivanna and it, of course we're different and that's that's okay anyway we're running out of time and I want I definitely want to let Jenny and and Sean um, speak and I also just I should have said this before um, a couple people have left but if you are able to keep your video on it means a lot 
to the meeting. Um, I know some people have bad internet um, and I know like, but I don't, um, especially when you're speaking, but even then, like I, I love when these meetings can really feel like we're as close as possible to when we are at the library and, you know, we would all notice when someone comes in late or dips out early. Um, so, you know, just just try to prioritize being being present at this meeting as a participant. Um, and I appreciate everyone who, who is able to do that. And you can always say, hey, my internet's bad. Otherwise, I would have my video on. Um, OK, thanks. <laughs> so Sean and Jenny. I just want to second the idea that Ann had about holding a public a public meeting as we get closer to finalizing this. I think I think that sense of community would really energize uh, the process at the tail end and make sure that we get a lot of public buy-in. You know, Zoom Zoom's been okay, but hopefully. Uh, with public safety and the amount of vaccines, uh, we could do a socially distant public public gathering. Um, but most importantly, the idea that popped in my head was, how about if we also invite all these other supervisors to that public meeting so they can hear directly from uh, Crozations uh, themselves instead of getting it filtered through these different um, sort of mediums. Thanks, um, Jenny. Um, I guess the comment I wanted to make was a comment and a suggestion for staff. And I've said this a lot over the years, but anytime you're talking about land use in Crozet, I think it's really, really important, even though I know you have the content and the packet to say urban density residential is 12, up to 12. And so it makes the conversation really confusing when in most places that's up to 36, but in Crozet it's 12. And specifically when we're talking about changing that to 24 or up to 18, I think we need to be very clear and always say that piece, even though I know you have it um, there. Because you know what I heard, I heard a lot of stuff when I listened to the board live that day, but um, a lot of my takeaways were some of what I heard from planning commissioners was there's so much detailed content. And I think it's difficult for people to understand all those nuances when they haven't been part of the process like community members have and Anne has and I have and, and, and you guys. But um, so, it, so there's all this material to review and then staff you know, aren't asking those questions that are necessarily specific to each of those areas for even just land use so because of time um and so i think that makes it challenging um and that's why it's so much more important to review those things that i think we assume people understand when we say urban density residential to a lot of people their mind goes right to the 36 and not the 12 and um and and the, the last thing i'll say is i was disappointed because what I really wanted to hear from the board was feedback about staff's suggestion for middle density residential, the newest version, which was up to 18, but there's a lot of detail embedded in that that I think is really helpful and good and um, interesting. And I didn't really hear much about that. Like over the 12, it would be affordability on top of what we would already expect. and those elements that you've built in and you know you could build those in regardless of the cap that Ned talks about but I really like those pieces I wanted to hear more about what people thought about that and so I was really disappointed that that wasn't part of the conversation um, that we could hear about that day and it was more it felt a little bit um, like some of the comments were a little more petty or judgmental about dynamics um, and less about content. And I'd hope to gain more perspective um, on what the board was thinking about those elements that we've worked so hard on for all this time. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I, I wanna try to wrap up because it's nine o'clock. Um, and I don't know if you had, if you still have your hand up if, if you had uh, something small. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. 
Only to say, I love the idea of inviting people to the open air meeting, but I will let you know that I am bringing tours one at a time of starting with the two newest members to take them, to show them our existing housing and our older neighborhoods and our narrow streets and all the things that we've been talking about. So they will have their own visuals to carry forward. So my first one is tomorrow and then another one in a week or so with Donna when she gets back. So um, let's just all keep plugging along. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for doing that. Um, and thank you, committee members. This is the first meeting of a whole new um, cycle of the committee. So I just wanted to reiterate that um, I think your maybe Anne or staff can um, remind me. I think you're um, you are supposed to let me know if you're going to miss a meeting. You also um, it's very helpful if you if you chime in and let me know if you're not going to be here. Um, I think you're only allowed to miss three, um, in which case you could be replaced. Um, but you know through application and appointment at, by the board um, and i also wanted to ask i think katia resigned so i think we still have one opening but i saw she was when i checked the new roster um, for this year she she's still listed on there so um i don't know if um we can still fill that spot if there were other people interested but um we i think we are our short one since katia resigned um a while ago. Um, but thanks to everybody for showing up and participating and I'm excited to uh, to um, serve my last year as chair. <laughs> um, all right and oh I have to do that little closing statement. Um, the CCA the CAC is next meeting is tentatively scheduled for um, May 12th at 7 p.m. Opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting will be posted at a later date on the Alvarado County calendar um, in accordance with emergency ordinance number 20A16 and open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, Thanks. everybody. Thank you.